priceless, as the title of the video suggests. But hear me out. When it comes to vintage watches, there are only three types of people. You have collectors, you have sellers, and you have people that have watches that they've acquired from family members, which hold a massive amount of sentimental value. Hence the title, Priceless, because they ain't selling it for no price. You can believe that. Welcome back to Urology Biology. I recently got contacted by a guy called Mark in the UK who wanted me to look at his father's watch. The name of the watch is a Thuria. It is a 17 jeweled hand winding watch and it actually goes under many of the different brand names. The main name of the company is Delmar and also they used other names like Delbana. Delbana I'm definitely familiar with. Thuria is a sub brand of their main company. The watch was originally purchased by Mark's father in 1958 while he was stationed in Germany and he wore this watch during the rest of his career. Mark obviously has the watch now and he wants me to service this watch, make sure that everything's good and bring it back up to speed. So I'm going to break it down, inspect it, run it through the cleaning machine and of course rebuild it. So let's start with the full strip down then of this Thuria watch. As you can see it's got caliber 330 on it which is from Pasuk, Pasuk, Pasuk. I am probably pronouncing that way wrong. So guys, please correct me how to pronounce that right because I'm not sure, it sounds French. So first thing that I'm gonna do obviously is just let's get this strap off. Uh, nice and easy, not complicated. Just easier to get it out of the way, especially seeing as I'm gonna be cleaning this case as well. I'm gonna run that through the ultrasonic so I wanna get the strap out of the way. Case has definitely been polished at some point in its life. Um, Mark wasn't too sure about it, but yeah, when I looked at it under the scope, you could clearly see that there was a lot of scratches which had been softened. So it was definitely a clear indication that it had been polished at some point. So a simple snapback case, uh, you just use a case knife for that and that comes off really easy. You need to be careful when you do that though. Uh, you don't want to push too deep and then have the knife slide into the movement and slice the balance in half or something crazy. That would not be fresh, no sir. So case back off and now we can start with the, the assemble. Movement held in with two movement holder screws to keep it secure. And I'm gonna just remove the winding stem obviously. Get the winding stem and the crown out of the way. Watch is running, but Mark basically said to me that it's running around an hour slower day. So yeah, it doesn't look too bad inside. Very, very dry um, probably not been serviced in years. He says he has no recollection of it ever being serviced at all. Uh, I disagree with that because I can clearly see in the back of the case back there is a couple of little marks uh, from a previous watchmaker at some point. Watchmakers used to do that back in the day. They would put their own personal little codes in and scratch in the back of the case back. Just as some kind of reference point to show that it's being serviced. So just removing these two screws which are holding the movement in place. Quite a pretty movement actually. Um, for a simple movement, it does actually look quite nice. As I'm sure you'll agree. Yeah. So I actually found out that the movement does actually come out from the front. And uh, so the crystal has got a ring around it, which you need to also take off with a knife. Um, and then the movement will basically just pop out of the front. So I'm just going to remove the hands with a Presto tool. It's just an hour and a minute hand, so it's not too difficult. And then you can see that there's the small sub-second hand. Hands are actually in not too bad a condition as well. I really like the way that they're quite large as well, so they seem quite oversized on the watch. And uh, watch is actually not that big, it's around 35 millimeter. 18 mil looks. So just putting plastic back on the watch now. 
so that I can remove the small sub-second hand. Now I'm going to use a pair of hand levers for this because obviously it is a lot smaller and I don't want to mess around with a Presto for something this small. I just find it easier to use the hand levers for something like this. And don't remember, remember what I said in uh, previous videos, make sure you keep them sharp. Sharp, super fresh, super nice. Now people have asked me in the past, uh, where do I get that magnifier from? To be honest, you can buy them at most places online. Uh, I got it from a local place. Uh, I think most electronic shops will sell them. And for me, it just saves me such a large amount of time and also saves me from breaking my neck. If it's like a three times magnifier on it and then you've got the big LED light behind it so you can completely see what you're doing. And I just find it saves definitely time. Uh, it's only useful for breaking down watches and rebuilding them. So basically just putting screws in, etc, etc. But considering that that's such a massive part of what you're doing anyway, I mean, why not save time and also stress on your neck? <laughs> so now I'm going to remove the dial and as we all know, it's held in with two dial screws, one on each side. So I simply just unscrew those and put them aside. And now I can take the dial off. A little bit of wear to the dial, nothing serious at all. I actually really like the dial, the way that the hour markers are sunken into the dial, which is pretty, uh, pretty cool. So off comes the Canon pinion, and I just use my Presto tool for that. Now I flip the watch back over so that I can remove the balance. It's always best to keep these things completely away from the watch as fast as you can. The hairspring is so delicate and it's something that will just cause you such a big headache if you drop it or if you catch a screwdriver in there because then you have to straighten the hairspring. And that's a pain in the ass. Some people enjoy that. I do not. <laughs> no, no sir. Not at all. So carefully just lift that out. Obviously you want to be careful because you've got the balance stuff on there as well and there's a pivot on each end of it. So you don't want to break that. So I always just lay it on my cushion and I flip it over so that it takes the weight and stress off of it. And then I just put it aside and keep it safe until I need it again later on in the uh, rebuild. So the next thing I want to do is I want to make sure that I remove any wind that's in the watch. Easiest way is just to try to wind the watch a little bit and then you can push the click out of the way and then just reverse wind it through your fingers and you'll feel the tension slipping. And that basically means that there's no power left in the watch so that when you start removing things, the last thing you want is this to start flying everywhere because that would not be fresh either. So now I can take the crown out again, obviously, now that that's been done, no need to use that anymore. Just one screw on the pallet cock. It's interesting though with a watch like this. So Mark said that he contacted Delmar, which is the main company. Apparently they are still in uh, production today. I had no idea. And um, they were not interested, no sir. And that's pretty much how it works nowadays. A lot of these companies that died of death in the seventies with the quartz crisis, as we say, they don't really deal with watches that were before then. I mean, even Enica, for example, I mean, Enica still technically exists as a company today. I mean, okay, it's, well, it's Hong Kong based and they have nothing to do with the original vintage Enicas that we all love. So of course they're not gonna touch them. And it's a similar situation with this. 
but there were a lot of Swiss brands that would use many of the names associated with that brand and I think it was just a case of creating variety for customers and them thinking that it was a different company but at the end of the day it was the same company and I mean we still have that today obviously with companies I mean there's companies out there that own other companies that you wouldn't think and yeah I mean if you look at Nike for example I mean it, it owns Converse and it did uh, I think it earned her it owned Hurley at one point as well maybe it still does I don't remember so Thuria uh, was a sub-brand, just like Delbana was a sub-brand. Big fan of Delbana, actually. There was really nice 1940s chronographs out there. A lot of those 18-karat uh, gold chronographs. I used to have one many years ago, which was a Delbana. So I've removed the ratchet wheel, and now I'm tackling the crown wheel and the crown wheel core. This is not a reverse threaded screw on the crown wheel, because there's two and for you guys that have watched my other videos you know i don't like those reverse threaded screw guys those guys that like to turn it and snap it the wrong way so at least with this one it makes it easier for them so that's the crown wheel and the crown wheel core out of the way so now i'm going to take off the uh, bridge for the the barrel bridge sorry my mind just went blank Hey, well, one thing that I've noticed on this watch as well, which I really like, and it's a good sign of quality as well. You see the jewel on the center wheel? Super nice to have that. I mean, it minimizes wear, because obviously from the center wheel post, you've got metal on metal. And by having a jewel on there, and it's a big jewel, as you can see, it minimizes the wear. So that's really nice to see. It's, it's just another sign of quality. Doesn't look too bad at all. So off comes the train of wheels bridge. And that's held in with two screws as you can see. And it's covering three wheels. So there's three jewels, obviously, as you can see. And once you've unscrewed it, just gently lift it off with a screwdriver. Most watches, they will have a little raised area on the side of these bridges so that you can pop a screwdriver in to gently prise it off. So it just makes life a hell of a lot easier, obviously. Because these pivots are super, super delicate and you do not want to break them, no sir. So then we can see the beautiful train underneath, all the wheels in alignment, which provide all the power down to the escape wheel, into the pallets. But it is interesting with this watch when you think about it, because it is technically a soldier's watch. It's not a military watch, as you would say. I have no idea why he chose this particular watch. I mean, obviously at the time, he probably fell in love with it when he saw it and was like, yeah, that's the watch I want for me. So technically, as the person was a member of the British Armed Forces, it is a soldier's watch. So that's the barrel out. And now I'm just gonna unscrew fully the setting lever screw. So the setting lever will probably just pop out the other side. And then I can remove the winding pinion and the sliding pinion. And they were pretty gunked up. Just with dried grease, I mean, they're Heavy greases are used on those kind of parts, so it's normal that they will be pretty gunked up. I'd rather have gunk than rust, put it that way. But this is interesting, now that I've flipped the watch over and you can see the size of this setting lever spring. This is the biggest one I've ever seen. It is massive, man. Look at the size of that thing. <laughs> Literally, 
stretches from one side of the watch to the other side virtually. It's a big spring. And then underneath you have got the minute wheel, the intermediate wheel, you've got the yoke, you've got the yoke spring. Guys, I have to say it, I am happy with the subscriber count. It's super nice that it's growing, nearly on 800 subscribers now, super fresh. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, I would very much appreciate it if you could. YouTube stick a lot of adverts I've noticed on my videos, and I don't receive anything for that, which is fair enough, and I'm kind of glad that they're showing an interest in me, so that's good. But I would appreciate it if you could subscribe to my channel. It would definitely help my channel grow. It would help me especially with funding things in the future because everything that I do is on my own back and a lot of it takes time and time is money. It's a simple thing to do obviously, you just need to click on it. Make sure that you click on the notification bell as well so that at least you're going to know when my next videos are dropping. So as the movement has been completely stripped down on this side, I thought I would just peg these jewels now. Saves time from doing it later. And it's really important that you do that. Some people don't do it and to be honest I find that super sloppy because it's something that takes 5 minutes and as much as a cleaning machine is really good, it's not a miracle machine. So a lot of those dried up crusted jewels you need to really loosen up all of that gunk that's in there. You don't really see that much of it sometimes under the naked eye, but if you look under a microscope, you will see that it is there. And the cleaning machine is probably not gonna penetrate through it all. So it's absolutely imperative that you spend that five minutes of your time as a watchmaker and peg those damn jewels, man. So now that the movement has been completely stripped, as always, putting the balance back in because it's the safest place to keep it once the watch has been fully stripped. So when it gets put into the wash, at least it's gonna keep that hairspring safe. So just popping the balance, sorry, just popping the uh, barrel open with the mainspring inside. And we can see a lot of dried up gunk in there as well. So just remove the arbor and then I can remove the mainspring as well. I'm popping a new mainspring in this obviously, I have no idea when this was last serviced. So it's always best if you can do it to just put a new mainspring in. They're not expensive, I mean they usually vote. they vary between anywhere between like 15, 20 bucks. And if you can get one it's just definitely advised. This mainspring doesn't look in terrible condition, but for a small cost, it's highly advisable. So pre-cleaning now, before we do the big clean, and again, pegging these jewels on the bridges, making sure that the barrel's all clean as well inside, getting off as much gunk as we can with the peg wood and a piece of rodico, and then I can basket everything up ready. Still cleaning that old mainspring as well, just in case, because you never know what could go wrong. So before I get on with the cleaning, I want to tackle these uh, hands and the dial. And they're not in bad condition at all, but I really like to give them a nice buffin, you know. It's not a polish, it's just like a buffin stick from Brajon. And it basically just removes any kind of light tarnish that's on there and it just basically polishes them up. And because they're so shiny and the case is so shiny, it'd be a shame not to do it. So I'm just giving these hands a nice buffin. And I'm going to do exactly the same to the dial as well. It 
It's got really nice hour markers on this dial. They're actually sunken into the dial, so they're level, but they're not just stuck on, they're actually sunken into it, which is pretty fresh. It's a really nice looking dial actually, and it holds a little bit of a secret, something I have not personally seen before, which you guys will see in a minute. That's definitely made a difference. So regarding the crystal, I was gonna replace this, but then I thought, you know what? There are some scratches on this and they need to be sanded out. So rather than actually replacing the crystal, I'm gonna restore the crystal. So I went through the gridding process and then I went through the polishing process and made it look like new. It is a bit time consuming and crystals are not expensive anyway, but because of the originality of the watch, and I know that it means a lot to Mark, I thought it'd be nice just to put that little bit of extra TLC into it and uh, make the original crystal look a lot better than it originally did. I'm also giving the case a quick polish as well. I'm strictly doing this by hand, so I'm just using some polishing cream and I'm just gonna go at it by hand and just give it a light a light polish and a light, bu light buffing, basically. All the parts now in the cleaning machine, been deep cleaned with all the Elmer goodness, and we can get on to the rebuild. So you know the deal with me, I will basically tackle the capstones first on the Inca block. And you just need to prise those off, one on each side. It's not too hard, but you need to take your time with it uh, because they are very delicate. And once off, I will basically just clean the capstone and then I will pop it into some fixer drop and then I can put a little tiny bit of oil onto it and then pop it back on. There's one on each side, so you've got one on the dial side and one on the other side, and you just repeat the process for both. And doing something like this is where the three times magnifier that I was talking about earlier is useless. You need to use an eyepiece for this, definitely. You can also do it under a microscope, of course. So once it's in, you basically just flip the Inca block spring back down and keep it in place. Speed it up the second one because it's exactly the same process. And that balance is running very nice and free. So now that's done, I want to obviously remove the balance again, because like I said before, it's something that you definitely want to just keep out of the way once you've finished with it. Some people do this at the end in regards to the capstones, but I prefer just to do it while the balance is on. Otherwise you're going to need to do it at the end. It doesn't make sense to me. So that's the balance off, again just laying it on the cushion, flipping it over so it takes any stress off of it, and then I'll just put it aside. So just applying some 1300 now to the barrel bridge, it's a hand winder, so no chrono grease for this, no sir. Just a few drops of 1300 is sufficient. and I can pop in this new juicy mainspring. It's actually easier as well if you have a new mainspring because they're already wrapped on. You always notice as well that they're color coded so that sometimes they're green, sometimes blue, sometimes red, and on the other side, it's always just silver for metal. And the clue is that the color side is the one that's facing you, so it always goes in that way. I mean, you should always double check which way it should go, 
but that's the given rule that the color side is the one that's facing you and then you just basically using a pair of the end of the tweezers you can just snap it in place and it'll just drop in it's pretty straightforward and it's easier actually than using a set of mainspring winders so now that's in i can put the arbor in and you want to make sure that that all connects correctly And then using this little tool, I can put on the barrel lid and then just basically just snap it in place. These are cool little tools. You can buy them very cheap and it just makes sure that it puts an even amount of pressure when you snap it down, similar to like a crystal press tool. So now I'm just adding some 1300 to where the barrel will go. Also for the center wheel as well. And I also add some for where the setting lever screw will go. All 1300. It's a medium oil. So in goes the setting lever screw. And it's always important, I always do it first, because if you forget and you put the train of wheel bridge on, then you're screwed because you can't put this screw in afterwards. And that's not fresh because you're gonna waste time. So my rule of thumb is that is the first thing that I do is stick that screw in. So now I can build up the train of wheels. You simply just work your way up, take your time. Make sure that you check the uh, pivots and everything on this in case they need cleaning. And when I mean by cleaning, I mean like further cleaning with like a, a jacko tool. Sometimes they can have rust on them and things like that or they can mushroom up and get out of shape. So you wanna make sure that they are smooth because if they're not, it's gonna cause friction and the watch is not gonna run really good. So I just put on the barrel bridge, which is quite a big one. So it's covering the center wheel as well with that nice jewel, which I'm really happy about. Really happy about that. And I just checked as well to make sure that there was not any play between the arbor and the bridge and it was pretty good. So now the barrel bridge is in, I can put on the train of wheels bridge. And again, just make sure that all of the pivots line up into the jewel holes before you screw it down. Otherwise you'll break them. The easiest way that I find with this, and not everybody says it, I will basically line it all up. I will do it as best as I can. And then I will take the movement, put it under the microscope, and just basically make sure that I can actually see with my eye that all of the pivots are through the jewels. It's actually a hell of a lot easier. And then of course, once you've got them all engaged, you can just basically put all the screws in. So I tighten them up, but not fully. And then I will keep checking it to make sure that everything is running freely. And then once I'm confident that everything is, then I'll fully screw everything down. So once you finish, make sure to clean off any excess oil with some Rodico. And now I can oil up the jewels. So I'm using 1300 on the center wheel. And for the rest, I'm using 9010, which is the finest oil. And less is more, guys. I can't stress this enough. I always stress this, but I'm stressing it more now. Seriously stressing it more? Now 
and I apologize for my big moon head in the shot. So I flipped the movement over and now I'm just going to repeat the process on the other side and now I can snap the cannon pinion on. Just put a little bit of grease on that as well, on that uh, center wheel post, just before I put the cannon pinion on. Movement flip back over again, and now I just add a little bit of 1300 on the arbor, and now I can build up the crown wheel and the crown wheel core. So I just pop that in place, and then I'm going to add a little bit of 1300 just onto the inside of it where the core will sit, because that will obviously rotate. And it's metal on metal, so you want to make sure that you do add a little bit of lubrication for that. Just minimizes wear and make sure that it, it turns more free. So it's held in with the two screws. So I'm in the midst of another video at the moment. I think the parts are going to arrive tomorrow for that one. So that's going to be a Sherpa Graph Mark IV. And I'm super looking forward to getting that video out. So I hope you guys are going to appreciate that one when it drops. Because those chronographs are super fresh. And this one's nice. So now that's in place, I will just put in the click spring, making sure that it's engaging, checking it. And then I can put in the click. And that's just held in with one screw. And making sure that you keep that damn spring held down with some pegwood, guys. Otherwise, that thing will fly. And it's not like you have a bag full of these things, you know what I mean? So you don't want to lose it. So now on goes the ratchet wheel and everything is looking super, super shiny. I mean, it's not that this watch was in a terrible condition to start with, as you can see. But it is always nice when you have a watch that has a nice story behind it. I mean, it reminds me of the Sherpa Ops that I did a few months ago. And uh, I got a lot of positive feedback from that. And people that actually have contacted me now with people, you know, watches that mean a lot to them and they're like, oh, I want that treatment too. I want that HP goodness. So once the ratchet wheel's all screwed in, just clean off any excess oil that you've left on there with some radical. So now I'm just gonna put in the setting lever and because of this, I need to obviously just hold it in place with a finger and then I can screw it from the other side. You don't need to screw it all the way because you've got to put the crown in and the winding stem. So just enough so that it's not going to basically fly away. So now I'm going to put in the winding pinion and the sliding pinion. Just add in some grease to this. As it's a, a high friction use part. So you want to add like a thicker grease. I think with this watch that I'm just most happy about is that I've kept the full originality with it. I've not needed to replace any parts, which is great. I'm happy as well that I did not replace the crystal because it's not that it's a special crystal, but I don't have one that looks identical to it. But at the same time, because the watch has such sentimental value, I do believe in keeping things as original as you can. I mean, obviously, if it was cracked, then, yeah, it's a no-brainer. You can't do anything about it, and you're going to just need to replace it. But this one had a lot of scratches on it. There was a few deep ones, especially in the middle, which it's normal. It's plastic at the end of the day. But you can get them out by just sanding it down and then building the grids up and then polishing it and it will just come out like new. Just need some elbow grease and some time. So that's the minute wheel on and also the intermediate wheel as well. So 
So a little bit of 1300 on the post where the yoke will sit. And a little bit of grease where the yoke will rest on the sliding pinion. And it's quite a long yoke, as you can see. And the yoke spring for this is a little bit strange, actually. Uh, usually they sit like in order, so it will the yoke spring will always be behind or in front of the yoke. Whereas this one, it's actually on the opposite side. You actually put the spring on the other side of the uh, watch and then it stretches over and hits the yoke. So now I can put the setting lever spring on this massive setting lever spring. Man, this thing is huge. But a clever design at the end of the day as well, because it's making because it's that big. There's no need for any other additional plate to cover the minute wheel and the intermediate wheel. This thing covers everything. So just holding it down with some pegwood uh, so that nothing flies away, because obviously it's holding a lot of things down. And then I'm just screwing that in place. If I can get the screw. So these things are slippy. So once you've screwed it down and you've got it all engaged, give it a few checks by pulling the crown, pushing it in and out, and then obviously clean off any excess grease that you've applied. When I'm dealing with this part of it, I always end up using a little bit too much. Uh, which isn't a problem as long as you just clean it off afterwards. So the movement has been flipped over again and now I'm going to tackle the pallets. Some fixer drop treatment obviously for the pallets is needed once they've been cleaned. And that basically means that when I oil the exit jewel, the oil is not going to run away everywhere because it's really important that you keep it all in one spot. Also, I use a little bit of wood on the pivots to remove the fixer drop because I want to minimize as much friction and drag as possible from this watch. Because you don't want any oil on those. You also do not want to oil the pallet cock either because there's no need. And all you're going to do with the oil is you're going to create drag and friction, which is going to basically wreck your amplitude. And that's not cool, no sir. So now I can put the pallets in, making sure that you get it lined up in the jewel, and then I can put the pallet cock on. Again, with something like this, you want to make sure that you check it before you fully screw it down, otherwise you're going to break the pivot. So just take your time, you know, there's no rush. I mean, it is only held with one screw, but it's still enough that you would break that pivot if you've not got it fully lined up correctly. Once you know you're good, then you can go ahead and screw it down. But again, I can't stress it enough, just take your time on this. Because you only get one shot. And this is a high pressure watch because it means a hell of a lot to this guy. <laughs> so once it's in, I will give the watch some wines and then I want to just check to make sure that the pallets are engaging. So you can just do that by tapping them with your screwdriver and they should just shoot from left to right. So then you know that the power is getting to the pallets. And then under the microscope, I will basically add some oil so that each tooth of the escape wheel gets a little drop of oil. And we're nearly there, guys. So just add in the balance now. Making sure that you've got your balance staff pivots aligned correctly. And it should just drop in place. Sometimes you can overbank them. If you do, 
it's not the end of the world, just take it off and basically just try again, pop it back on again and uh, you will get it. And the watch fires up, super nice. So the balance cock obviously is held in with one screw, so I'm just going to screw that in now. I know everything's engaged good, so I can go ahead and tighten that up correctly. And I'll just wind the watch up. So a little 1300 now on the Canon pinion. And I can pop on the hour wheel. Nice shiny brass color. Make sure that you've got it engaged. And last but not least, I can pop on the dial washer. And now I can put the dial on. And I thought I'd actually shown this on the shot, but I hadn't. But what I wanted to mention about this dial being a little bit of a secret dial, underneath the dial, it's actually printed on the back. Um, if I pronounce it rightly, it is the Yeller & Co uh, from Geneva. And they actually made uh, a lot of dials for Rolex as well. A lot of Submariner dials have got their make maker's name on the back of the dials. It's literally the first time that I've seen it actually on a dial. So what we can say about that is, is that this dial has been made by a very high quality dial manufacturer. And of course, no one would ever know that until you pop them the dial off and see it yourself underneath. So now I can go ahead and fit these hands using the Horotech press. First the hour hand and you can put it on wherever you want because there's no date function on this watch. So make sure that it's not hitting anything once you put it on and then set it to 12 o'clock so that you're ready for the minute hand. So just Take your time on this, put it on, make sure that it's aligned with the hour hand on 12 and then you can go ahead and then just press fit this down. If you're enjoying this video guys, please hit a like on this, I would super appreciate it. You can also subscribe to the Horology Biology channel, that way you're going to know when the next videos are going to drop and you'll get a notification coming up on your YouTube. So last but not least, we need the seconds hand going on. Same method as the others, but obviously make sure that the um, hour hand doesn't hit it. So once you've got it pressed on, make sure that you check the time of the watch by uh, moving, the, moving the hands and making sure that the hour hand has got enough clearance from the seconds hand because if they're too close or they do touch then it will stop the watch something as small like that will stop so now we've got the hands on we can case this up and we're getting towards the end which is super fresh not running into big difficulties which is always super nice and as I mentioned before, this one goes in the front, so we just simply drop it in place. Then I will put in the winding stem. So 
So just give the crystal a quick blow, make sure there's no fluff on there or dust which has popped on, because it's amazing how those things collect dust, <laughs> seriously. Even just sitting there for just like two, two minutes, it can get little pieces of dust on and there's nothing worse than dust underneath a crystal. It's irritating. And that just clicks into that crystal ring. And then I can simply just pop that on. It's just press fit and it wasn't particularly hard actually. I thought I would need to use a, a press for it, but it simply just was pressed on with my hands. No stress. And last but not least, I will pop on the movement holder screws. Two large screws, one on each side, and they basically just keep everything held together so the watch doesn't rattle around. It's not a waterproof watch in any shape or form, which again surprises me why he chose this watch, especially being in the industry he was in. And, and also that the watch hasn't died because there's no gasket or anything like that on the watch. And all I need to do now is basically just put the case back on. So just the final checks and we're pretty much done guys. Very happy with how this has turned out. Watch looks beautiful, especially with the crystal all super shiny and looking super nice and super fresh. The only thing we need to do is just check it on the timer to see what it's looking like. Of course I will regulate it in a few days, but let's see what it looks like initially. And that's not too bad. No sir, that is not bad at all. So there we have it guys, the 30 priceless to some watch. Guys, until next time.